Today is my pleasure to interview Basta Beva. Nominated by Raymond van der Biesen in a previous interview. I've been fortunate enough to support Bas for the last nine years as a strength and conditioning support in his role as a head coach for the Dutch national BMX team. Yep. Bas has been a successful athlete himself. Wikipedia says you won everything there is to win in BMX. Uh, not everything, but a lot. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And. Uh, Third at the World Championships in mountain bike in Then I went on doing mountain biking and I got a bronze medal at Worlds in 96. Uh, and I quit racing in 03. Okay. Um, Bas is coach for the Dutch national team in the fourth Olympic cycle now. I think most notable the success is recently the double Olympic champion in BMX retired, Marvis Tomberg. And in an interview he said, he was asked who are the next guys to follow in your footsteps. And he named two, three names and he said, and the Dutch team. Oh, really? So I think that says enough, this uh, part of past efforts to bring the depth of the Dutch national team to the top of the world. And yeah, welcome Bas. Thanks. Let's get sure. started. Let's do it. In your life as an athlete or coach, what was your darkest moment? Um, I don't really try to look at my either active sporting career or coaching career and, and, and emphasize on these darkest moments or best moments. Obviously there are these moments and you can look at them as from a, a result point of view. Um, but you could also look at these questions from a process kind of view. Uh, view. And that's what I tend to do normally. Um, but if you ask me a question, what's your darkest moment? Um, obviously, Yellis crash is the first thing that, that, that pops up uh, earlier this year. Um, but then going back to results, it's um, you know there's a few things. There's Worlds in Holland in in 14 where no elite man made it through the final. That's not really what you want at your home turf Worlds. Um, so I can name a few results. Um, but I'd like to focus in on the process. So if if, if that doesn't work, the result doesn't come. Um, and, and in the 15 years I've been doing this, you know, you're working on that process every day. So every day there's the darkest moment, and every day there's the best moment. Um, but in the whole, and in the context of the question that you're asking me, is is definitely yellow. Is, is by far, obviously, the darkest moment. Yeah. Yeah, I believe that. How did you recover from that moment? Yeah, it was a tough one. I mean, a really tough one. Oh. First and foremost for Yella himself, obviously. Um, but <coughs> working with him for ten years um, it created a bond. And then, if you know, if this happens and you see what's happening with 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 Yella and and whatever he went through up until you know today. Um, yeah, especially the first, let's say, four, five, six months were were hell. Um, you know, you hardly sleep. It's it's constantly on your mind. But uh, along with Yella's recovery and his outlook on his own life, uh, helped me, weird as it sounds, in um, taking this all in and process it my way. Um, to a point where you know. Now you know life. Life continues, and we're and we're moving on, and, and and we're back on track again. I think, but it was it was a, it was a, it was a tough one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So for those who are watching, um, Jelle van Horkum is one of our athletes, and he had a really terrible crash in practice, which resulted in being in coma yep. for a few days, weeks. intensive week, weeks, intensive care, and it's life threatening, and. Um, so he's recovering now. Um, yeah, what also is an interesting one. He was the one who brought us a silver medal, right, at yep. the Olympics? Yep, in Rio. Yep. In Rio. And uh, yeah, one and a half years later, he has that terrible crash, which is probably makes him unable to ride again at a competitive stage. Life, we never know. Life changing, life changing moment for him, for sure. And uh, yeah, that's a tough one for Boston and myself and many people involved. Yeah. Um, also, there was 
in that process not only Yellow crashed, there was also a liability question regarding your person, whether yeah. you yeah. missed duty of care, right? Yeah, but that, that's off the table. It's, it's, uh, I mean, insurance companies now are just working out um, mm -hmm. a deal, if you can call it that, how to support Yellow uh, from here on forwards. And that's all happening in the background. It's, mm. I have no clue what mm. we're discussing. To make it more difficult at the beginning of the interview, I also noted down a few more things. Um, over the years I've worked with you, you have gone through many challenges, right? You have taken coach's decision, which every coach does, but then people turned around and accused you for things you haven't done. Yep. Uh, that was a tough one, I think. Yeah, I, I mean, if you're, if you're meaning the, uh, the lead up to the London Olympics, um, and which women we selected to go there, then yeah, that was a tough one. Um, we had one spot, and only so only one woman uh, could go, and we decided uh, on one of the two girls who um, uh, qualified through our criteria, um, and the other girl didn't agree, so she went to court and, and, uh, to check if we went through the whole procedure just. And we did, um, but yeah, no, moments like that are not the most pleasurable ones. How did you keep your confidence during these moments? I don't want to sound... It would be very easy to throw the towel and say, hey guys, just do it alone. Yes, well, that's, but that's not me. I mean, I set goals for myself. I did that when I was an athlete and I still do this, you know, in my job and role as a coach. And, and if I can't get to my goal... Um, you know, this way, I, I'll try to go the other way. Um, I'm, I'm not not out of the field that easily, um, but that's more who I am from my character. That doesn't mean it doesn't hit me, doesn't hurt me, it does. Um, but then, you know, you can step back one, two or three steps and instead of looking at the one incident that's going on or the one thing that's taking negative, giving you negative energy, you know, step back, look at the whole picture and sure and soon enough you'll get your positive energy back again that plus you know you work with athletes every day and these guys are very driven and girls and um, very talented and that also you know gives me positive energy so if something negative comes by it sucks you deal with it um, and, and you try to move on and helped by like i said definitely the athletes you work with and the supporting staff around it i mean you yourself you know you, we see each other in the weight room a couple of times a week. Um, and it's also your the way you present yourself towards the athletes, towards me, that gives me and the athletes positive energy. And that goes for everyone involved in a sport program, and in this case, the BMF program. <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's sometimes hard decisions, hard consequences. Um, not easy, but you know, try to look for that positive energy and, and, and move on. What, what's your best moment? Well, again, also here, uh, I can name a few results, which you know, over the last 15 years we had really good results. Um, but also in this case, like I said, for the darkest moment, it's the processes that really uh, attract my attention. Um, but then, no, again, results could be Neeks World Championship as the first year's elite in 15, and it could be the Cruiser Championship in, in Australia. Uh, in when was this? In, in, in 09, I think. Um, European Championships, World Cup wins, World Cup titles. I mean, you know, it's results. But the underlying, the process, you know, before you get to that result is to me uh, more interesting. And what goes for that darkest moment goes for that best moment. You, you know, you're trying to find one every day or every week, or every block of training, or, you know stuff like that. Mm. Uh, I've noted down there there's a question for later, but it fits very well in here. I, I think what I really always like about you is even in the moment of defeat, you could all, can always find something positive mm. that helps you for the next step, right? Yeah, that's also my biggest downfall, uh, I think. Um, 
I always look at things from my character, from who I am, at, at, at the glass is half full. Um, and obviously, that helps you give you positive energy, but it sometimes makes you deny uh, the bad things that you have to deal with, right? Personally or an athlete. Uh, but in general, uh, yes, I always try to, I, I, I try to look at the negative, but really try to find the positive and then connect those two to make you know, the next move to improve the healthy. If you could go back in time 10, 15, 20 years, what advice would you give your younger you? Um, that these processes that we've been talking about, um, these take time. And I'm a very... Um, how do you say? Um, impulsive kind of guy. Um, so when I started out 15 years ago as a coach, in my head, because you know I've been an athlete 25 years before that, and then it was just me. You know, when you're an athlete, it's the world spins around you. At least that's what you think. Um, so if a decision should be made, and I make one, and then five minutes later we'll go that way. But as a coach, it's a bit different. Um, you still have your own views and philosophies, but you have to deal with 10, 15 athletes who are way younger, totally different personalities. Um, so younger, boss, um, be aware these processes take time and don't try to force these processes in a week's time. You know. <laughs> that, that's probably the biggest advice I would give myself. What's your coaching philosophy? Yeah, that, that's always a typical question that's been asked to coaches. Um, What's a coaching philosophy? Uh, I, I, you know, I, we're working in an individual sports. BMX, BMX is an individual sport. It, in the end, it's what the one athlete in what position he crosses the line. In order to help that guy or girl cross that line first or on the podium spot, um, you can train and coach one on one with this guy or girl, but you can also put them in a structure. Um, where the whole is bigger than the individual. With other words, a team can make an individual stronger. Um, that's pretty much one of my philosophies, I think, or led by. That's exactly what I've written down as a note, as a follow-up question. You almost reiterated over the years that the individual needs the team In to be stronger. In my opinion, opinion, yes. Yeah, yeah. And I'm sure there's examples out there, and there are. I mean, I, yeah, we worked with Laura Smolders uh, for a few years. Yeah, she went through our uh, talent program, and then she, she got in a high-performance program under me. Um, but she find, found out three years ago, three and a half years ago, that this environment at Papendal and our uh, uh, way of coaching didn't really fit her um, personality. So she decided to uh, uh, set up her own team structure. Um, and voila, here she is. I mean, I think she won pretty much every race she entered this year. So not to say that the way I look at things and coach people is the best for everyone. Um, so if someone decides to move on and, 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 and look for things that will better them, um, that, that's only good, I think. Um, so yeah. Does that answer the question? <laughs> core values. What are your core values? Yeah, that's another one. As uh, you know, like what's your coaching philosophy or what are your core values? Um, in terms of openness, you know, communicate. Um, with each other, give an athlete the feeling that he or she can always be herself within the group of people uh, that we work with daily. Uh, you know, they need to be able to express themselves even though the teammates don't agree. Uh, there should not be a barrier of which uh, would make sure you could not be the true self. Um, so I think that's a really important 
compel you to work with daily. I mean, there's a whole list, but it's 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 the you know you get into the cliche values. But for me, what I'm just trying to say is, is an important one. Yeah. Also, I think what I've seen over the last years, you always very disclosed and honest, right? So if something comes up, you deal with it immediately and you just <laughs> say what you think. Right. And people tend to see, tend to take that holiday. Yes. Not always, because I know that's not, that, that's exactly who I am. I, if there's a problem, I, I'd like to grab it, shake it, and move on. Instead of just, you know, let, let it rotten for weeks or months, and then it just gets bigger and put, it's been put out of context, out of proportion. So why not deal with it right away? Um, and then me telling things as they are, as I see them, you know, that, that's also a, a bit of a, you know, it could be a, 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 down, a downfall. Um, people, some people could, you know, not take that very well. But like you said, it seems like people in general respect the openness. And, uh, and I think that's a good thing. I mean, by being open, you obviously, having the risk of having criticism back, but that's good because that gives a discussion and that in the end could or should improve a situation. Yeah. So yeah, I'd, I'd like to be as open as I can. Yeah. And which which I really had to learn or teach myself because by nature I'm very close person. I, I tend to keep my emotions, especially when I was younger, for myself until the bucket, you know, the, the saying, the bucket full of water, one drop, and then it, that drop, when it falls, when I was younger, I exploded. So I taught myself, and I had to, in this job, you have to, right? Because you're responsible for other athletes and not just yourself anymore. So I had to learn and teach myself to be open and speak about my emotions, and that was a bit rough in the beginning, but I think you know, I, I picked it up quite well. Part of your coaching philosophy has always been the MBTI, right? So the Maya Bridge. Yeah, type MBTI indicator. or action typing, whatever. The, the whatever. Why does that help you? When I started coaching 15 years ago, the NOC uh, and it still exists. You know, they got their master coach program, uh, which I attended uh, the first. I think I was in the second class. Um, threat to that whole coaching class was uh, action typing, you know, like characterizing uh, people um, and catch their ca character in four letters. Um, to me, back then, that was abacadabra, because like I said, I was pretty much coached from when, one day I was an athlete, the next day I was coached. So, and then all this information you get at the beginning is a lot, it's a lot, and you know, you can't really prioritize it or, or something like that. But um, action typing was a red threat and like I said it was a bunch of abacadabra but through that coach, uh, the coaching um, uh, clinic, I, um, I've, gotten, I've grown closer to that concept and I really dove into it and, and tried to figure out what, what it really means. And, and after three or four years, I, I, I think I got a very good handle on, on MBTI and action typing, any of those types uh, of character typing. Um, and I use it in my coaching. So the <coughs> best way to say it is if, if I know you, if, and I'm not doing it exactly as MBTI says or action typing says, you know, I'm, I'm using those letters to characterize you and, and put you, okay, he thinks along these lines. And so if I want to tell you something, I got to bring it in a way that fits your character. If you know how I am, that makes our collaboration uh, a lot more easier. Um, and also take us back to the athlete level, if, you know, because there's a bunch of different characters and if someone reacts to a certain situation in a certain way, the other athlete's like, what the, why, why do, why, why do you do this? If he knows, uh, how she or he um, thinks that makes things uh, easier in coaching. Having said that, that's also the hardest thing to do, especially especially with young athletes. You know, they get into our program, 14, 15, 16 year old. If I sit down with them and hey, listen, we're going to do an M MBTI test, they're like, what? 
So it's it's a tough one, and it takes time. But once uh, it lands with this athlete, I think it makes working with athletes and staff uh, a lot easier. And how do you how do you determine them? Give them a questionnaire? Yeah, there's different ways. I mean, if you Google MBTI or action typing, there's Generally, you get three choices. You can do the shortlist questionnaire, the intermediate, which is, I think the shortlist is 20 questions, and then there's one with 40, and then there's one with, I don't know, 100 or something. Uh, so if you want to really uh, go in depth, you go for the, the 100 questions, or you know, the big list, the more questions. Um, and then you take the information off it. Like, like I said, I'm not, all right, this is the outcome, this, so this is how that guy or girl is. No, it's just for me, it's general information on how to approach this athlete. Which person has influenced you the most and why? Um, there was, actually, there's two. I'm a, I'm a person, I'd like to find things out myself. I'd like to dig in stuff and that's how I learn best. Someone can tell me stuff, but I really have to feel it and experience it. Um, so there's, you know, as an active sport, back in the day, I've been also asked the question, who's your example and all that. And yes, you have people that you look up to, and, but examples, I always try to find my own way. But then getting into coaching, it changed a little. And so that for me, there's, there's, I mean, there's a bunch of people who influenced me, especially in the beginning in, in, in this coaching job. But two in particular I, want, I, I, I would like and can name. Your colleague Jim McCarthy, who was my first SNC <coughs> coach in, in, in our program, he, he, he taught me a lot. At least he showed me a lot. Maybe not purposely, but he did. Um, and then a guy called Ad Roskam, who now uh, works at the uh, Athletic Federation. Um, he was uh, uh, working at the Olympic Committee before he did this job. And he was my entrance, entrance into the NOC, my connection to the NOC, um, what we in, in, in Holland in our structure called prestatie manager. Um, he definitely in the beginning showed me, I did a lot of management stuff from, from, um, and direction and you know, what way to think and how to perform in sports in a coaching role, you know, not as an athlete, but in coaching. Um, so these two people definitely had, a, had an influence on, on my outlook on coaching. How do you manage the team? How do I manage the team? In what way? It's a very open question. Yeah, exactly. uh, I, I have a note here to follow up. But, um, um, to be a bit more specific, I mean, I mean when, I, when I started 15 years ago, maybe this is what you mean. Um, there was no structure in BMX. Um, there was, there's teams uh, out there and you know, everybody did their own thing. But there was no one had any idea, and I'm generalizing now, what high performance was all about. So I thought, all right, let's start with telling all these guys what high performance sports is all about and <coughs> what it takes to, you know, to, to get um, to get at a point where you actually perform at a <laughs> global level. Um, when I started, I had like a big 15 or 16 athletes, and they all had their own little team sponsors, or the local, you know, the, the, the bakery and uh, that kind of stuff. So when we get to races, uh, as a national team, you know, I gave them an orange jersey, because we wanted to race in an orange jersey. That's, that's our thing. But then, yeah, but I got this sponsor, and he got, comes to me and I got this sponsor and they all want their own sponsors and things on their jerseys and it was a big hassle for me. Um, before I started this job I had 10-12 years of mountain biking as an athlete and that's where I learned, that's where I learned what high performance sports is all about. And so I tried to translate that what I learned there to BMX. So I, although it's a, it's a it's a national sports program funded by the Federation and the NOC. I try to build it up as a commercial team. So I try to look for sponsors, you know, everybody on the same bike, same clothing, same helmet, same, same everything. It makes everything easy. 
So these guys don't have to look for sponsorship because they get it from the team, from the national team. And it makes my life easier. I don't have to take in consideration all these different individual sponsorship deals they have. Um, so how do I manage a team like that? I look at it as a, as a commercial team, as one team, although it's not, you know, at every moment in time, someone can either leave, be put out of the team, or come in, be invited into this team. Uh, dynamic, uh, but from a managing perspective, I look at it as a, as a, as a commercial team. And uh, that started with what I just said, looking for sponsors 15, 14 years ago. But that also resulted in, you know, setting up uh, uh, how we work with each other on a daily or weekly basis. You know, put some things on paper there. So it's in the 15 years later, it's it's pretty structured, and everybody knows what their task is within the team, athlete, staff, coaching. Um, <laughs> But no, yeah, I just try to look at it as, as, as a measure team. I've worked in different sports and across different countries. And regardless of sport, there always seems to be a bit of drama in the sport. In some sports more than in others. Hmm. In your team, there's hardly any drama. At least I can't see it from within within the within the team members. Yeah. And why then? Then I go back to the big to to the question you asked in the beginning. It kind of relates to that. What you, know, you asked me what your uh, brightest moment or your, you know, your best moment, best memory. That's exactly this. Um, being able to set up such a structure that yes, there is drama, but it's. It's drama that you can micromanage on a daily basis. You know, I didn't sleep well. I had a fight with my girlfriend or my parents. Or you know, it's, it's it, you tackle that on a daily basis. I tried to set it up, and again, back to the beginning, to be, to be able to be uh, set up a structure where people can be open and be themselves, and and that gives little drama, like I just said, on a daily or weekly basis. But you can handle that quickly and easily. And, that's that's the staff that's responsible for that. But mainly, it's the athletes themselves. They want to pick up the structure, and they, you know, they're willing to go along with it and be as open as they are. Um, How do you manage team expectations and individual expectations? I mean, in the end, they have to qualify as a team, but then the individual is yes. looking for the. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, it's morely about individual goals than team goals. The only team goal there is, is once every four years, we as a country need to qualify for the end. It's not an individual qualification, it's a country qualification. So that's only once every four years. But every other year it's an individual goal. Um, or individual expectations. And that's, that's a tough one, because athletes, well, I, I think people in general, they thrive and live daily by expecting something that's in their agenda. You know, people look in their agenda, oh, younger people go to school. Today I got math and German and English, I'm just making up stuff. So they have an expectation on how that will go. Same with athletes. You know, they're doing a training session or they have a race. And whether or not they want it, in general, I think, they have an expectation of that race or that training session. And if that expectation is too high, most of the times they come back with disappointment. And dealing with disappointment is good, but if you set your goals or your expectations too high every week, you can only deal with so much disappointment before you drop out. Um, so a big part of, of the results is managing those expectations. And that goes better if you talk with someone, an athlete that's you know, in their late 20s and a lot of experience, they see that. It's an easy talk. But do the same talk with a 16, 17, 18 year old athlete, it's a completely different job. Because they think they can handle the world as they see it. Um, which is good for them at that moment. But um, they tend to, therefore, tend to have more expectations of themselves than they can handle, in general.
there's, ex there's exceptions, of course. But. So yeah, no, managing those expectations is a big thing. And then the follow-up question is, if I look at the last eight years or whatever, we always had two or more guys that were competing for the top spot. <coughs> the guys changed, but it's still, yeah. they're all top, not all, but at least two or three guys that are top of the world. Yeah, from any generation they work with. From, yeah. I think what's also very interesting, is how did you manage that, I mean, they're obviously they're competitors, but they are also friends, in a way, or at least mutual, yes. mutual respect. Yes. Yeah, so there's no enemy kind of thing. So they mm -hmm. all, yeah. how did you do that? Well, I, I, I can't really point out how do I do that, but, or what did I do, but it has, in my opinion, a lot to do with what I said earlier, is, is trying to set a stage where everybody can be open and honest. Um, um, and that, that goes as far as that leads to um, what you're now asking me. You know, having people constantly uh, performing at, you know, let's say the top eight level in the BMX, you know, constantly being in that final or on the podium, whether it's these two guys for these two or three years and then the three years after that will hopefully be other guys and in the past it was other guys. That says a lot about our program and the consistency about, uh, of it, I think, and that's not just me. That's In the end, it's uh, um, we've been the ones that set the stage by allowing these athletes to develop in a certain way, but it's the athletes themselves in that process that strengthen that process. You know, a new guy comes in, he gets picked up by me, but also by these group of other athletes, and very fast he or she gets the memo, not literally, but um, that this is a, a, an environment where you can really develop yourself. I don't mean this in any cocky way, because it's not. It's, it's definitely not just about me. We. We're just the ones giving the you know, the platform, and shape it. But through time, it's it's almost a, a self. It's not a self fulfilling prophecy, but it, it perpetuated. Yeah, exactly. And yeah, it has a lot to do with how you manage things, but it, a bit of luck also is involved. I think you know, in a way that. Which athletes do you invite in this program? Obviously, their character needs to fit our working environment. You know, also our group can be four letters. Right? There's a general. If we go back to MBTI or action typing, your I'm an ISTP, and if you have 15 people together and you put all their personalities uh, into a pile, there's also a general personality for that group. So people that come in. And that, that probably shifts, but new people come in and other people leave, but those who come in, in order to um, develop their potential, they kind of need to fit the group's personality. And what I said earlier, earlier, Laura obviously missed out maybe by her feeling something in, in this group process. So if you feel that, and that's a very adult decision to make for someone who's back then on um, but that says a lot about that person um, so yeah it, it someone also needs to fit this environment in order to develop to their full potential I mean if you put another coach in my position another dynamic another philosophy and athletes coming into that coach program you know, kind of have to fit his philosophy and vision. Uh, and that goes for all players and sports, I think. Uh, generally. Has being an athlete helped you with your coaching? Oh, definitely, yes. Especially from the training point of view. You know, like... like um, the periodization, uh, what training forms um, needed to be done um, definitely helped me in, in setting up my weekly training programs. Coaching, not so much. Uh, it helped 
in the sense that you, you develop some kind of empathy because you know, you know, if an athlete is at a world championship and he either won or failed his goals, I know exactly how it feels because I won and I failed my goals as an athlete. So in that perspective, it helps me to pick up that signal maybe sooner than if I would not have been an athlete on that level. Um, but it definitely helped me on the, on the training side of things. Yeah. Do you think someone can be a good coach without be, having been an athlete? Someone definitely can be a good coach without being an athlete on a high level. And I think it helps, and I also think that someone also can be a really good coach without being ever being an athlete at all. But looking at sports specifically, I don't think people who go into coaching have are affectionate, are having a, an affection with, with sports in general. So it's very fair to assume that everybody who works in sports and coaching to some degree has done sports, whether it not, it's been on a global scale or on a local scale, it doesn't matter. Um, but in the whole spectrum, being a high performance athlete before you're coaching or not being a high performance athlete in coaching, yes, it definitely helps, I think, but it's not really a necessity, I think. Another typical question, let's see if you answer that. Motivation versus discipline, what's your take on that? Yeah, funny one. Uh, motivation, I think it's it should be intrinsic. Uh, I cannot motivate you. If I if I needed to motivate you, you're in the wrong place. You need to go and do something else. I can inspire you, but that's a totally different thing. Um, and yes, if you're not motivated for a day, because you know yesterday something happened at home and you lost your motivation to train today, then I can inspire you, to help say something to you or show you something. Or that's where discipline kicks in. Um, you know, when you're not motivated, but you really need that session in order to be at your best in three weeks' time because of the world champs. You make up an example. You're not motivated, but then you need to be disciplined. You know, to overwrite that motive, not having motivation, but still doing your work. And then you know, it's a whole, it's a complex process because it's it's not just the physical work you need that day. It also goes hand in hand with you know how your mental state is and the motivation you have that day through that process. But in general, I think motivation should be something that you have and it cannot be told. It cannot be taught. If you're not motivated to be the best BMXer, leave, go somewhere else. So motivation should be something that lies within you, I think. Um, and discipline um, could help you if you're not motivated for a day or two. But they're both subjective to the person, right? It's, it's not an objective thing, discipline and motivation. It's a subjective thing and it's subjective to you, me, whoever. Um, but no, yeah, motivation to me is something that you need to have for whatever it is that you're doing. Otherwise it's not going to happen. And I cannot tell you, hey, get motivated. Doesn't work. Um, it's it's within you. How do you choose your support staff? What qualities do you want to see? Well, obviously there's there's specialized quality. If I look for a physiotherapist, I want him to be a very good physiotherapist, <laughs> or a doctor, a very good doctor, or a mechanic, a very good mechanic. Or, you know. um, If, I mean, I'm, we're in a, our athletes are in a full-time program. I'm in a full-time program, you're in that full-time program, but my physio, and my doctor, and my mechanic, they're not, they're part-time. I do not have the money in the program to have full-time um, physios and mechanics. So what really important is for me is the, um, the translation these specialists, whether it be a mechanic, a physio, a doctor, the translation they can make between what they're specialized in and the sport they work with, in this case BMX. 
um, two of my physios have raced BMX, so they can easily translate if someone, an athlete, comes up with, hey, my shoulder this, or my knee this, or my back this, what do you do? We've well, done this and this. Oh, on the bike and start, you know, they can really link things together, so that's an important thing um, that I look for in my staff, whether it's doctors or physios. How does a typical day in the life of a coach look like? <laughs> well, mine starts at 6.30. Nine out of ten times my, my alarm is set at 6.30. Um, I try to push out some emails in the morning. My um, first session normally starts at 9, 9.30. So I leave home at 8.30. Do some prep work, do a first session, and in between it kind of depends where we are in the, in the year or in the four-year cycle. Now, for instance, a lot of time goes to meetings in setting up criteria for the Olympics or working with the NOC towards projects they have uh, towards Tokyo, right? Thermo Tokyo is one of them, um, which is all good, but it, 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 it takes time, so that keeps you busy in between the sessions. And then normally I leave Papano between five and six, um, and then at home, uh, again, I started, it, it's a constant thing, it's 24-7, you're the only sitting on the couch or the kitchen table or in the car or even if you're visiting a friend at night and having coffee you're still in the background you know the thing is is running is there anything that you should change for next week or tomorrow for this guy or that girl so it's, it's a constant constant thing um, important thing for me what i always try to do is sleep is an important thing um, stress and overthinking can keep you from sleep and that throws you into this vicious circle of you know, not sleeping and being more stressful. Um, no matter what I always tell myself at night when I go to sleep, because I tend to rattle, keep rattle. I try to fall asleep and I keep rattling. Like, what I should do? All right, shut it off. There's nothing you can do now at this very moment. Go to sleep and pick it up again. Tomorrow. That's a conscious thing. It may sound weird, but what I try to tell myself, not daily, but a lot of, a lot of times at night, is I tend to keep thinking about what is it that we can do? Yes. Got to be uh, self-protective about that, I guess. At some point. Absolutely. Do you want to nominate someone to be interviewed? Do I want to nominate? Yes, I want to nominate someone. I mean, we can do an athlete, but I'd like to hear, especially after he's a young guy who raced, who got a bronze medal at World Champs in 04 as a junior. It's Sanders brother, right? Sanders brother, yeah. And then he, he didn't really make it to the elite level. You know, the big hills came and wasn't really his thing. So he went on and did physio and now he's in the midst of doing manual therapist course as well. So yeah, let's do that part. Let's be silly. Yep. Nice. Thanks for your time, boss. Thank you.